socialism, communism. I'm sure that as Indonesians, some of you might find that the sheer mention of these words to be daunting. They certainly carry a ton of weight, especially considering the assassination of the military generals. You know, the one, the one that we hear uh, during our history lessons in school. They pretty much represent, well, they're pretty much the sole representation of Indonesia's understanding of leftist ideologies. Historical nuances aside, I'm sure that due to that event, any potential of propping up leftist ideas has been relegated to absolute irrelevance. That alongside with how people conflate being an atheist with being a leftist when they're mutually exclusive. I can't stress this enough. Like you, you don't have to be an atheist in order to be a leftist. And just because you're a leftist, that doesn't automatically mean that you're an atheist. It's frustrating when people still use these talking points and frankly sad when people still fall for it. Hello there. Welcome to the Pit of Tangents. For this segment, I'd like to share with you how I got exposed to left-leaning ideas and how we've pretty much been sold of a boogeyman that, that is not only misleading, but to some extent, we may or may not have embraced. From this point on, instead of saying communism or socialism, I'm just going to say leftism or leftists or left-leaning or, or whatever. I understand that it's you can argue that there's a meaningful distinction between the two, but it's just not relevant for the discussion. So aside from the dark history that we were taught, at a conceptual level, we were only told that leftism equals central planning. Leftism is government seizing the means of reproduction and then distributing it to the population. I slightly touched this issue in my political compass test video, which by the way, feel free to watch it after this. The saddest part is that this misconception applies all the way to university level, which can either be attributed to the teachers or educators at a question fearing for themselves for providing a more elaborate explanation, which can be taken as an endorsement of communism, or students simply unwilling to inquire further as they have dogmatically accepted that, well, communism equals bad. Well, this is sort of true that the end goal of leftism, at least to my understanding, is so that all goods and services, including with the production and distribution that comes along with it, it's so that they they are publicly owned. You know, like the whole um, the whole to each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Unfortunately, people would then take the word publicly owned and interpret that as state owned, one where the government gets to rule without question, or essentially a dictatorship, if you will. In reality, democracy is at the core of leftist thoughts. Even, even for the proponents of central planning, I, I doubt that they envision it as you know, like government bureaucrats making it, making all of the decisions without any form of accountability. Sadly, sadly, the existence of the Soviet Union under Stalin's rule and the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot, yeah, they they. They didn't make it. They didn't make things easy for us to make our arguments. I'm sure that there's bound to be like a ton of nuance as to why history then remembers these people as what I like to consider to be wolves wearing sheep's clothing. Communism as the as the sheep's clothing, and totalitarian dictatorial government as the wolves in this case. But hey, I mean, like Hitler started his his rise to power in what is it, the, um, the National Socialist Government Workers' Party? So if there's a lesson to be taken from this, don't, don't hinge your entire nation's future on one person. This is a, one of the main tales of a fascist government, you know, like the, the ardent belief of the strongman narrative, the, the charismatic ruler and all that. Anyway, before we, <laughs> before we get lost in the weeds, how is leftism talked about today? <laughs> As a concept, leftism has definitely made a resurgence on popular discourse. <laughs> Whether or not this is a product of my own ignorance is besides the case, but nevertheless, if you if you just 
spend like a minimum amount on the internet and have yourself have the slightest exposure to political content, it honestly wouldn't take long before you encounter this topic. This includes countries like the United States, which, which is a country that you would often consider to be the heart of capitalism. Similar, similar to Indonesia, leftism has had a bad rep in the US, largely due to the Cold War with the Soviet Union. At that time, anyone who dabbled with leftist ideology can be accused of treason. Sounds familiar? You can probably draw a comparison to how, upon the elimination of the Indonesian Communist Party, families that even have the smallest ties to the former party members were then forced to, ha- to, have, to have different ID cards, which, which if you think about it, it kind of sounds familiar to, this yellow, to the yellow patches that Jewish people have to wear during Hitler's Nazi rule. So, yeah... Yikes. However, things have started to change. You can see this from two of the most recent presidential elections, where one of the candidates, Bernie Sanders, openly declared himself as democratic socialist. And that is the path that I call democratic socialism. The same can be found in and this group of people that is commonly referred to as the squad, these are, these are progressive uh, Congress people and senators from the Democratic Party. One of the most notable examples being Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or AOC. They have certainly faced major backlash, be it from the Republican Party, the conservatives, or, or even modern Democrats, constantly being called communists as a scare tactic similar to that of the McCarthy era. Yes, I won't try to feign ignorance, all right? The same level of condemnation can be found from many leftists, calling them out as merely posturing leftist aesthetics while ultimately still engaging with bourgeois democracy. You know, like um, becoming roadblocks from allowing the inner contradictions of capitalism to facilitate the material conditions that could lead to a revolution. Now, before I start rambling about political efficacy, like reforming the system from within and the consequences that come along with it. Let's uh, let's get back to Bernie and AOC. What do they even stand for? One of the core policies made popular by Bernie Sanders was Medicare for All, which is essentially a universal health care for U.S. citizens. One of the th- main things that he keeps repeating throughout his campaign and Honestly, throughout his political career was, healthcare is a human right. Wait, that sounds awful. Yeah, I, I, I cannot do a Bernie impression, I'm sorry. Another example would be AOC's Green New Deal, which is basically a bill that seeks to pave the way for US transitions towards green energy, while at the same time ensuring job security for those working in the fossil fuel industry. I know these policies fall more under social democracy, which is essentially capitalism with wide social safety nets. The fact that they would then backpedal and equate socialism to Scandinavian countries further exemplifies that. Even so, if I might argue, you'll, you can't really know people's ideological stances now, can you? Who knows? I mean, it could be that Medicare for All or Green New Deal are just simply policies that they deem to be feasible to be implemented in the US right now. Other policies that these politicians are generally advocating for are level wages, stronger collective bargaining through unionization, defund the police, welfare distribution, ease pathway to citizenship for immigrants, stop the wars, yes, stop the wars and imperialism in general, and of course, uh, equal rights. Equal rights for marginalized communities, be it women, LGBTQ people, and racial or ethnic minorities. I hope when you see these policies, you would agree that they're actually fairly reasonable. Heck, I hope, I hope that when you see them, you, you start to see where you probably share similar beliefs as they do. Of course, I, I won't blame you if you start to wonder, okay, what would these leftists be pushing for once these policies are implemented? If indeed, Medicare for All and Green New Deal are just stepping stones. 
The words that tend to be echoed is building a classless and stateless society. Now, I can't speak for everyone, of course, but the way that I interpret a classless society is one where there there will be no longer the distinction between the bourgeoisie and well, the proletariat, where where everyone has an equal stake in the means of production. Everyone has a say in what to produce, how to produce, and so on. Admittedly, I'm still a bit shaky when it comes to stateless society. Like, I feel like it's a bit of a disservice if I were to say it's merely a revamp on the current governmental system by making it more accountable to the people. Like, who knows? It could be a complete overhaul in a way that I, as of yet, haven't been made aware of. I've glossed over some stuff related to councils and syndicates, but but I have to read or listen more to people with, with anarchist leanings on how they envision it. Most of the things that I've been exposed to are related to the economics or social side of things, not necessarily governance. I guess there's a reason why when I took the nine axis test, my result was libertarian socialist. Full disclosure, by the way, Bernie and AOC, they, they weren't exactly my first exposure to love discourse. Actually, it, it all started from, from a seminar hosted by Students for Liberty, uh, a right libertarian think tank. I know that it sounds counterintuitive, but I promise you, it'll make sense eventually. The topic of the seminar was Austrian School of Economics. Now, being being an undergrad economics student at the time, I was really intrigued. So, leading up to the seminar, I, I did some research. This exposed me to people like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. How, how then I realized that there's actually a difference between Keynesian economics and Austrian economics. Albeit only, only at a surface level. To get the general gist of it, I would recommend the epic rap battle between Hayek and Keynes. Mind you, however, the, the account behind it, Emergent Order, it has, it has right-wing libertarian written all over it. So the video is meant to be in favor of Hayek. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the visuals weren't exactly subtle. It's still interesting nonetheless, though. This is tied back into when I mentioned about curated information. I'm sure you've probably seen some of the epic rap battles between prominent figures, but you wouldn't think that they would make one between competing schools of economic thoughts. In the videos, they have two parts, by the way, the main contention is whether or not during an economic downturn, should we utilize government spending to help us out? Or should we be more prudent and allow the market to resolve his own condition. Not to both sides things, or as the internet would say, an enlightened centrist. Well, they're both kind of right. On one hand, during an economic recession, say like the pandemic, you can quickly see how people lose their livelihoods and where then they are just simply left to fend for themselves. Now, during this type of situation, whether we like it or not, the government is simply the only entity with enough power to keep everything together. You might say, what are you talking about? Our government is barely doing anything to help its people. That's true, but that's largely due to the fact that our government representatives are mostly in bed with the corporations. You can thank the lobbyists for that, or as uh, to adopt the term from the right libertarians that they tend to use, rent-seeking. This is why most of the government stimulus that we see are disproportionately designed to keep these companies afloat. Unfortunately, it's even worse for this country because many of the major business owners, they're the government. This includes major sectors like energy, mining. So there is salient criticism that the right libertarian are saying that I would agree. But it's not to say that left-leaning people don't have their shared grievances on how the government is currently being run. I can assure you, we are totally aware of this. You can generally lump this together as anti-establishment rhetoric, but the difference lies within the solution. So, on the right, you would often hear, we need less government, which 
Well, you know what? They are right. In the way that the government is currently being run, there are many ways in which the government can and must be deregulated. The only difference with the left is that we also believe that there are many ways in which the government can and must be expanded. Like, do you honestly believe that there are enough regulations to ensure that companies don't blot out the sun or to ensure that they don't work their employees to an early grave? This is why I really hate people who would say something like, Increasing the size of the government would only lead to rent seeking behaviors, yes? Therefore, we must abolish the government so that we would finally be free from the tyranny of the bureaucrats. Quite, quite, yes. I mean, I mean, if you take a cold syrup, that could potentially make you sleepy. But does that mean we should stop taking cold syrups at all? I mean, God, I thought leftists are the ones who don't understand nuance. Anyway, to to get back to providing stimulus for companies. Right. Uh, on the face of it, okay. On the face of it, that's not entirely wrong. Okay. During an economic downturn, depression, whatever it is, you would want to keep businesses from closing to prevent the economy from collapsing, essentially. But due to how companies are run, prioritize profits, prioritizing the interests of the shareholders, in the face of falling demands, layoffs are just inevitable to reduce costs. What happens to the people who lost their jobs? Welp, this brings us back to the situation where people are just left to fend for themselves. Of course, the, this is... This can easily be mitigated, given that there are proper financial safety nets, be it in the form of unemployment benefits or or universal basic income. Or let's say that companies that these companies are only eligible for the support, given that they don't fire their workers. Mind you that these are not radical ideas, okay? They're not only feasible, they also have precedence. You may begin to notice that there are two distinct approaches. In the context of public policies, these are generally categorized as top-down and bottom-up. Top-down policies are generally stimulus for companies. So we're talking about tax cuts, tax exemptions, tax breaks, and well, you name it. And they're done in hopes that these companies would then hire more people or keep them in this case so that they can provide income for these workers, which will then in turn be used to purchase goods and services. So the economy keeps on going. In contrast, bottom-up policies rely on the people. So the government ensures the people's purchasing power so that they can still meet their basic needs, essentially, which in turn ensures that the businesses don't collapse. This is actually one of the chorus lines in the video. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit, it's quite catchy. The only difference is that top-down is portrayed as government policies in general, whereas bottom-up is, I guess, the people and the companies as proxy of the market? This means they are taking one step back in perceiving all government interventions as top-down, which uh, I guess it makes sense, given their viewpoint. Distinct as they may be, they are not mutually exclusive. Guess what? You can have both, which is pretty much what we have right now, even though it does lean more towards one side, which I'm pretty sure you can guess which one. Okay, where am I going with this? I'm sorry. We we started with a rap battle between Keynes and Hayek, which I'm pretty sure is just a broad generalization of their ideas. For instance, in Keynesian economics, which I assume to be the basis of my curriculum when I took my econ grad, undergrad, uh, in, in Keynesian economics, applying prudence and in intervening in economy is something that's already recognized through the idea that too much stimulation? <laughs> it's not a sexual pun, okay? <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter, sorry. <laughs> too much stimulation could lead to an overheated economy where supply could not keep up with demand. From heck, or at least the general arguments that I tend to hear from right libertarian people, which I guess is a synthesis of their thought leaders. So we're talking about 
what was it? Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, Ayn Rand, and, and Thomas Sowell. Those are the, the only people that I know. Well, well, in the video, okay, so like in the video, they did put an emphasis on savings, but their main argument is basically to reduce government interventions as much as possible due to the fundamental shortcomings of government interventions, such as informational lags and rent seeking, as I mentioned before, that, oh, the government is too big, they have too much power, and that their interventions tend to do more harm than good. That being said, at the time, being the economic student that I am, whose curriculum mainly revolves around Keynesian economics, my reaction was, well, Keynes won, hence that. <laughs> Mostly because uh, I was simply not convinced with the argument that, oh, the government trying to steer the market is inherently bad, or nor, nor do I find the whole encouraging savings as anything particularly insightful. Before you think that I'm being reductive, don't worry, I, I know that I don't have the proper understanding of right libertarian economics, which I intend to cover in future segments. Look, I'm, I'm even willing to come out and say that, in all likelihood, right libertarians are those that I'm going to agree with the most out of anyone else at the political spectrum. Not by much, though, so don't get your hopes up. Oh, by the way, for the sake of clarity... Keynes is not exactly what you would consider as left economics. I mean, I've, I've been told that there's, uh, there's post-Keynesians, which is like the left wing of the followers of Keynes at the time. So there's left and right within Keynes' camp of school of economic thoughts. I, I, I don't know. That, that's something I will cover in a future segment as well. But, but within the purview, within the framework of the utility of government intervention, that does put Keynes more on the left. Speaking of rap battles, this video, that video, led me to another rap battle video. I know, there's like plenty of epic rap battle videos, um, only this time it's between Ludwig von Mises, another prominent right libertarian figure, versus none other than Karl Marx the daddy of the left. <laughs> um, similar to Emergent Order, this is also a right libertarian account, AIER, so it is safe to assume that it is meant to side with Mises. It should come as no surprise, however, that I still end up siding with Marx, I know. It's just that I had more fundamental disagreements with what Mises is advocating for. And this is when, when Marx is portrayed in his more extreme interpretation. Here's one example of the disagreements that I have. In the video, Mises argued that Marx's surplus value is nothing but a bogus equation. The heart of your theory is exploitation of surplus value. That's a bogus equation. This has something to do with the employee-employer relations, where employees are bound to be paid less than the value of the goods that they produce. The discrepancy is what is then called surplus value. Now, if you take into consideration taxes, investment costs, and other costs, it's basically profit. So how is that a bogus equation again? All right, all right, sure. The main point is that profit is inherently exploitative. <laughs> we, we sure assign a total moral weight there in the word exploitative. But, um... <laughs> But if you take into consideration how things work today, how the bargaining power inherently favors the employers due to how the production system is designed and how job offers are highly centralized, which just exacerbates how disproportionate that power is, these factors allow employers to have far more leverage to keep wages as low as possible, creating a situation where people simply could not meet their basic needs, where how much the laborers are getting paid in exchange of their time and energy is far less compared to how much business owners, how much CEOs and shareholders are getting. Now, from a right libertarian perspective, this often leads to the subject of voluntary exchange, where if two consenting adults agree, like let's say an employee agrees to work for an employer for a sum of money, then how can that be coercive? 
Well, my dude, <laughs> how the hell can you consider that as a voluntary exchange when one party is literally under the threat of starving to death? There's this political live streamer, Vosh, he's He's one of my favorites who made this analogy when he was debating uh, the presidential candidate from the Libertarian Party of the United States. His name is Adam Kokesh. Something Let me ask you a basic question, okay? Let's say that you are on a plane and that plane crash lands on an island, okay? Um, there are only a few survivors. In fact, there are only two. And you wake up after the first one does. By the time that you have woken okay. up, the other survivor in this plane has claimed all of the coconuts on all of the coconut trees, stacked them on their pile, sheltered that pile with all the wreckage from okay. the plane, and declared sure. they own it. And they say that they would be willing to give you said coconuts if you throat their cock. Now, would you okay, consider no, that no, to be so a that's... voluntary interaction? <laughs> Is that a voluntary interaction? Okay. Now, tell me if that's not coercive. That's basically how things work right now. So do not be fooled if they say they want to strip the government from all of its corruptive powers, because that includes no minimum wages, no social safety nets, all under the guise of, it distorts the market. You can you can say voluntary associations all you want, but if that leads to a situation where people have to succumb to the benevolence of the wealthy for an ounce, and I do mean an ounce of a decent life, you can go fuck yourself. Do you want to know what I find most amusing? After claiming that the concept of Marx's surplus value is nothing but a bogus equation, the dude who represented Mises basically said, Value is subjective by every measure. One man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> so let me get this straight. You you basically revealed yourself that what you're paying the labors are equivalent to trash? I hope there's more justifications to this. That that Mises do hinted at this guy. Von Baum Bavirk, another Austrian economist who claimed to have debunked Marx's uh, labor theory of value. I'll, I'll look into that in the future. Apart from the surplus value debacle, if you want to call it, Marx's portrayal lean more towards one that necessitates violence and whatnot. The term that they used was what he's advocating for is based on control, not cooperation. They weren't they weren't exactly subtle about it either. I mean <laughs> I mean really throwing the bourgeoisie to their deaths. Not to feign ignorance. I I know that a lot of left-leaning people have revolutionary tendencies, but to say that cooperation is not one of the core tenet of leftism thoughts. It's, it's just baffling to me. Like, okay, which one do you think has more control ingrained to it? A workplace where the labors have more say in how the business is conducted, or one where it is run by the board of directors who, for the most part, are only beholden to the interests of the shareholders? Here's another example, or a government where we hold the representatives to the highest possible degree so that they would implement policies that represent our interests, or one where they are simply in the pockets of corporations that barely pay any taxes. Let's not kid ourselves, only the most fringe right libertarian people, commonly referred to as ANCAPs or anarcho-capitalists, who advocate for the total abolishment of the government. Not to be lumped together with left-wing anarchists, by the way, because there's no way in hell we will ever allow transnational corporations to even happen without any proper democratic control of the workers and the society that it interacts with. Most right libertarians would categorize themselves as minarchists, where, and I'm, and I'm generalizing here, by the way, where they believe in a government that has the monopoly of force and one who bears the responsibility of enforcing property rights. So technically, the main distinction between left and right-wing libertarians are basically how they want to build a society that maximizes individual freedom. And honestly, I'm, I'm just not sold to what the right-wing counterpart is 
is proposing. Not not when it lacks the understanding on the inherent power dynamics between the employee and employers that puts one more powerful than the other. Not, not when it lacks the understanding on the necessity of having a government that protects its people from basically people who consider greed as their gospel, profit as their god. Oh god, I feel like we're we're getting lost in the weeds again. I'm I'm sorry. You might be confused at this point for a, for a segment that is meant to be about my exposure to left discourse. I, I sure as hell spend quite a lot of time comparing it to the libertarian right. The irony is not lost in me. Okay, this whole thing started because I was attending a seminar hosted by a right libertarian think tank. It's it's actually funny that. Attending the event actually made me even more intrigued with left-leaning ideas. In fact, oh god, this is actually quite funny. Um, at that time, I didn't even know that there's such a thing as left-wing and right-wing. I didn't know the difference. All I know was there's socialism and capitalism. <laughs> I'll admit that in, in retrospect, I was probably very annoying during that seminar. <laughs> I was I was like constantly asking questions to a point of arguing with the speakers. Not not that we don't have any areas of agreement though. Like like I've mentioned, I do agree that the government should be deregulated as much as possible. That rent-seeking behavior is a cancer to our society. At the same time, however, there are just things that I fundamentally disagree with. Oh, not to mention this, this asinine notion of equality of outcome. Holy shit. Oh. The way that they keep peddling this honestly nonsensical idea. For, for those who don't know, right-wing people tend to make this honestly ridiculous straw man that the ultimate goal of leftism is to create equality of outcome that these postmodern neo marxists they they seek to rob you of your individuality and make you nothing but the zombies of the nanny state <laughs> now let's think about that for a sec um how is that even possible like how is it even humanely possible for us to have identical lives Oh, you're being so disingenuous. Obviously, they're referring to economic and social policies. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Let's let's bring the policies into consideration. So, with having a higher minimum wage, a stronger collective bargaining, wealth taxes and whatnot, would that suddenly make us all unable to pursue different paths in life? Like, even at at the most extreme version, you know, like the whole to each according to his ability, to each according to each needs, does that make us all Bill Gates? The thing that frustrates me the most is that these people would then posture all the time on how capitalism is more favorable as it ensures equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. Well, on the same breath, would defend unlivable wages and detest any any form of social safety nets and thinking them as nothing but handouts. I think this was slightly touched during the seminar. I, I, I could be wrong. Obviously, the speakers were against social safety nets. I believe the topic was Medicare for All. When I spoke against them, I used an analogy that I got from my lecture, actually. Yeah, so picture yourself as a child in a race against your peers. But for every privilege that you have, take a step forward. So whether or not you were born in a two-parent household, the social economic class that you were born into, the school and the university that you get to go to, your, your race, your ethnicity, your religion, these complex factors play a lot in the kind of opportunities that you can have in life. In other words, we may be in the same race in life, but we don't start on the same line. So, if anything, 
Social safety nets are one of the ways of ensuring, of making sure that everyone has equal opportunities, to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to fully realize their potential. This ties back to the age of reason, or enlightenment. It was born during the French Revolution, where they basically toppled the monarchs at the time. It was Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. They basically ushered in a democratic society that ensures the common rights of men. Yes, just men. Sorry, ladies, we were still far away from women suffrages. Now, from this revolution is one of the building blocks of capitalism. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. The promises of capitalism. Where there is a discrepancy between how things are and how things should have been. Therein lies the critique of capitalism. The heart of leftism. Okay, I think this is a good place as any to end things for now. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm probably going on a limp here by openly declaring these policy propositions as leftist ideas. However, I do hope that you are willing to see beyond the labels and instead value the substance. If, the, if you think that they warrant criticism, feel free, go ahead. I'm definitely not the true arbiter of leftism here. I'm still learning, but honestly, so far, all of the things that they are advocating for appears to be aligned with my moral values. Next, I will delve into my exposure to online politics. We're talking about YouTube, Twitch, and worst of them all, <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> um, this is also where I'll be talking about social issues. So we're talking about feminism, LGBTQIA+, and race. We'll see how things go. We'll see how things play out. If it turns out it's too long, I'll just break it into a separate segment. Yeah, so I guess that's it. Um, I hope this is not going to be another hour-long segment. But yeah, if you enjoy this, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment down below, and ring the notification bell icon so that every time I upload a video, it goes directly to your feed. I will also be releasing this on Spotify as a podcast, by the way. This is going to be my first episode. The plan is to expand on the movie sec movie reviews that I've been doing on Instagram and also plug in some YouTube segments that I think are podcast worthy. So yeah, uh, make sure to follow and maybe who knows, maybe if you're more of a podcast fan, maybe you'll enjoy yourself there even more than here. Okay, and of course, as always, links to my socials in the description and the end card. That is all for me for now then. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.